Well, welcome to another edition of Let's Talk. I'm your host, Denise Rollard Barnes, and this is one of our most favorite times of year, Black History Month. Black History Month. I don't know why we say it's our most favorite time of year, because as you know, with the Black press, we celebrate Black History 365 days of the year, 24 hours a day. But, you know, we want to use this opportunity to highlight some of the people and within our community, not only those uh, past that we want to remember, but those who are making Black history right here and now. So we are so happy about the show we're bringing you, uh, to you today. But we want to thank you, first of all, for joining Let's Talk. Again, I'm your host, Denise Rollard Barnes, publisher of The Washington Informer. Today also happens to be Groundhog Day. Now, I don't have a relationship with the groundhogs. I don't know where they are. I don't know where they live. I don't have one of those little uh, black suits with the tall hats that the men stand out there with the groundhog holding him all morning, you know, and then they put him down somewhere to make sure uh, to see if he sees a shadow or not to determine whether spring is going to come early or not. But I predicted spring was going to come early and evidently the brown groundhog and I have something, uh, you know, going on here because he has informed uh, the rest of the country that spring in uh, the United States is going to come early. I'm just ready for spring. I'm not a winter person. I don't know about y'all. I mean, born in December, but I can't do it. I just cannot do it. So I am so happy that spring is coming soon. Uh, here is a cloudy day in D.C., but we're going to have some sun today and over the weekend. So, Mr. Groundhog, do your thing. I'm so happy that you have given us that great news. Now we'll probably get another snow, snow, little, little bit of snow somewhere along the way, but you know we can handle that. Knowing that it, it, everybody knows in D.C., it could snow today and be 70 degrees tomorrow. So uh, that's what it looks like. But today we're highlighting, as I said, inspiring individuals who've made significant contributions in their respective fields. And we're going to begin our first segment in a discussion with Lynn Dyson creator of the Multimedia Training Institute and a former member of the Black Repertory Theater here in DC. And we're going to talk all things theater, but also a great Black history program that the uh, Training Institute has coming up uh, later on this month. We also look forward to talking to filmmakers Pamela and Gil Nelson, uh, who are going to tell us about some projects that they're working on. So we're looking forward to hearing that. We uh, expect to have Ogo Ewoyoki, who is here to discuss uh, the disparities in government contracting for business women uh, of color in healthcare. Uh, looking forward to that conversation. And last, but of course not least, Lauren Vaughn's gonna be with us, Executive Director of Samaritan's Inn, and we're gonna talk about dry January and addiction recovery. You know, it's funny, uh, Chevy, I talked to an owner of one of our uh, Black-owned li liquor stores here in Washington, D.C. the other day, Chats Liquors. And I told Bernie, I said, you know, I don't know how you're doing this January, but it is a dry January. He said, come on, February. <laughs> February. <laughs> you know, because that's how he makes his money. We don't have to overdo it. Uh, but the point is, you know, we want to support our Black businesses. And he just happens to be one of those that actually has a fantastic business on Capitol Hill. Give him Chats a shout out. So I hope you picked up a copy of this week's Washington Informer uh, and check, uh, that you have checked out our Black History um, section in this uh, week's Informer, our staff. I'm so proud of the Washington Informer team because we try to, try to stay on top of everything. I mean, everything. So I noticed we're even squeezing in more stories on our front page because um, there's so much going on in the city. So I wanna congratulate the team for bringing us another great edition of the Washington Informer. And there's some great stories in here. So you want to pick up the co a copy of the paper. We're in about over 500 locations throughout the DMV, uh, metro stations, um, you know, Safeway, Giant, uh, places all over the city. So if you see the paper, it's free on newsstand. So make sure you pick up a copy. And uh, But you can also read the digital edition online at Washington Informer. Dot com. Again, just go to WashingtonInformer.com. There you can pick up a copy. I mean, you can read the digital edition and all the news. We do a newsletter, which I hope that you all will consider signing up for. The newsletter comes out every single day called Win Daily. 
And we like, we like our acronym, Washington Informer Newspaper, W-I-N, Win Daily. That comes out every day. So you can uh, consider and we would encourage you to sign up for the Win Daily. That's free as well. And we send all of the new top stories for the day, as well as a lot of offers and opportunities um, that are going on in the community. Uh, people advertise with us and get us ask us to promote their events. And we do that through our daily newsletter. So go ahead and sign up so you don't miss out. Uh, I wrote someone a letter today and I use that word FOMO, fear of missing out. If you get win daily, you do not have to experience FOMO because you will know all about what's going on here in the DMV. Um, again, uh, if you are watching us today, be sure to share this broadcast on all of your social media platforms. Uh, we are on Instagram, X, formerly known as Twitter, Threads, Nextdoor, YouTube, LinkedIn. You can find us there and all of the links are uh, below on the screen. So it certainly does. I mean, it really helps us folks. If you actually go on to whatever your favorite channel is and follow us or like us, that helps us. Sometimes people ask you, how do you make money? You know, the paper's free, the, your newsletter's free. You know, these days it's all about the numbers. It's all about the numbers. And our advertisers just want to make sure that we're not shouting to the wind, that people are actually on the other end of what we produce. And the way we know that is we can count you. So go ahead and sign up. And when you do, um, feel free to give us feedback on the stories that you've read. If there's things going on in, in your community, your organization, your church, uh, you know, share that information with us, but also share it with your friends, your colleagues, your family members, your, your, your child's teacher, <laughs> all of that. So uh, share it. We really do appreciate that support. Again, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well at Washington Informer TV, no spaces, all one word, Washington Informer TV on YouTube. And you can follow and subscribe to us there as well as you, your support helps us to sustain our publication. Um, Curtis is not with us. Uh, Knowles is not with us this week uh, with our regular broadcast. But of course, the big story for us today is the sad and tragic loss of our very own Joe Madison, the Black Eagle. Uh, we got word yesterday that Joe died uh, from, uh, he's had a long battle with prostate cancer and, um, you know, he really fought hard, but we all have so many wonderful stories that we can talk about our time and experiences with Joe Madison when he was uh, on um, WRC radio uh, for many years. He worked with Kathy Hughes uh, at Radio One. Uh, he went to Sirius XM. But he's always been out there in the community fighting for the things that he felt were important from uh, fighting uh, apartheid in South Africa to uh, dealing with uh, police um, uh, involved shootings of young people. I remember uh, Joe um, and Reverend Fonjoy uh, had a march uh, from Washington, actually from Prince George's County, uh, Maryland, out to Annapolis because of uh, the tragic death killing of a young man named Archie Elliott. Um, and Archie, we've had his mother on the show before and Archie was followed by police uh, from Prince George's County into the driveway of his parents' home. His father's a judge and killed in that driveway. And Joe Madison, um, Reverend Fontroy and others, you know, led a march 26 miles, I think it was, to um, Annapolis. I went to coverage, Chevy, uh, <laughs> and ended up walking the whole time, whole distance with them. And it was it was quite an experience. And I think it sent a message. But Mrs. Elliott is still fighting that struggle. And Joe Madison, as you know, with Dick Gregory, had done many um, hunger strikes, uh, just trying to bring attention to the issue in Somalia and some other places around the world. Um, he was an active member of the media. He wasn't one who just sat behind a micro microphone and talked about the issues, but those that he really was concerned about, he was out there involved and um, advocating uh, for those issues. So we're going to miss Joe. We really are going to miss him. And uh, our condolences go out to his family, his wife and his son. 
and all of his family members and his audience, the people that love the Black Eagle. Um, so we, again, we will miss him and uh, we will do a, a, a tribute to him uh, in weeks to come. Uh, as soon as we know more about the memorial service for Joe, um, we will uh, share that with you. And you can go to the Washington Informer uh, website to read an article by uh, Stacey uh, Brown, as well as Hamil Harris. They're putting together pieces right now on Joe and getting comments uh, from the community um, to talk about the impact that Joe Madison had on this community and around the world. So yeah, uh, thanks, Sherry, for posting that picture. And you know, a lot of people may be saying, well, who is Joe Madison? He hasn't been on the air for a little while because due to his illness, but he is a was a stable in uh, the Washington community and in radio. And as a matter of fact, I just talked to um, uh, Mark um, a few minutes ago, Mark Thompson, uh, who was uh, also was a great friend and colleague of Joe's and hopefully we'll have him on um, at some point to talk about, you know, that experience working with Joe Madison and, and he was so knowledgeable about so many issues. You know, some of us, including myself, may get on and, and try to try to get through a subject. Joe studied. He made sure that his audiences were not only informed. He was the one that helped to come up with that theme, information is power. If you remember that on WOL, he and Kathy Hughes always talked about information is power. And so, again, we say... Um, so long uh, until we meet again. Now we'd like to bring on, it's kind of hard to make that segue, and I'm sure Lynn Dyson knew uh, Joe as well, but now it's time to bring on Lynn Dyson. <laughs> oh, Denise, that's just, that, totally, that totally blows me away. I wanted to be all up about my project, but I'm just hearing this. I'm devastated, Denise. Yes, Joe yes. spoke truth to power. He was a giant in our community. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. I did not know. And, you know, it's, um, you know, Joe went on, as you know, um, Lynn went on a hunger fast and then decided at some point that, um, I mean, he completely changed his diet. Um, yes. And we try these things sometimes, you know, this, this whole issue of prostate cancer, uh, as we know, devastates the black male community. Mm. And so this will, uh, you know, make us bring that issue back to light again. And yeah. uh, as we remember him, and I'm sure he would want us to really talk about, you know. Yeah, us black men, we're all at that age. I'm definitely at that age. We have to continuously get checked. Well, that's a good thing. I'm glad you say that. Continuously yeah. get exactly. checked. That makes yeah. a difference. Every, every, at least twice a year, you know. So, um, <sighs> Sherry, um thanks for joining us, Lynn. <laughs> Let's kind of make that I know. Let's make that transition. Um, yeah, let's try to make that transition and uh, tell us tell us about the D. Well, you know, we, we're going back in history because Joe was part of our history. Right, he and was. you are too, Lynn. I mean, you've been out here struggling and fighting and trying to keep the black arts alive, and yeah. we appreciate yeah. you for all you do. Um, you know, as we do a little his black history moment. Talk a little bit about the DC Black Repertory Company. Yeah, well, you know, Robert Hooks founded the DC Black Repertory in 1971. Uh, people who don't know him, he founded the Negro Ensemble in New York. Uh, when you think about uh, Denzel Washington and, and, and all of the, all, just any black actor you can think of today, they stood on the platform of the NEC. And as a result of them having a continuous place in New York to perform live, all your big television producers came and saw them. So then all of a sudden, they're, going, they're in Hollywood, they're in TV shows. You know, Lynn Whitfield came out of the DC Black Rep. So, you know, Hooks was a trailblazer in doing that. And uh, he, you know, if that was no uh, uh, DC Black Rep, that would be no Multimedia Train Institute. He gave so much to us, and he was a role model, and we, we have to give back. So he still had a training program in theater, and I, went to Howard and communications. And because of my theater background, I tied a theater and a communication together and I have to give back also. It, it, I have no choice, you have to do it. So so those of you go go to Google, uh, 
Robert Hooks, DC Black Repertory Company. You know, I could be here all day talking about that. Yeah. We don't have that time to do it. <laughs> well, the other thing before we move on, um, you know, we've, we've seen um, a, a lot of drama happen, happening in the uh, television, theater, film industry right now. I mean, Taraji P. Henson, Henson yes. sort of brought out the fact that Black actors don't get paid what they do. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of drama, I call it, happening out there. Okay. And, and this is not anything new. This is historic. But um, one, I, I mean, on one note, I'd like for you to, to maybe talk a little bit more about some of the folks from, from the D.C. area that that are actually in, you know, our heroes, our sheroes, people don't, we don't remember that actually came from Washington, the grassroots artists that we produced in theater. Right. But also, where do you see us going? Are we, are things getting better or are we just at a standstill? I, I think things are getting better. I think with the new technologies, just like Pamela and, and the other gentleman, the, the husband and wife team, they're coming on. They're, they're producing their own stuff now. They're networking with, with Amazon Black. So there's a lot of opportunities being presented with this new technology. And so I, I think things are getting better. And we as Black folk uh, can stop being producers start creating what we need and hiring our people and, and so forth. So I think things are getting better. I mean, it's the same old, same old in Hollywood that's going on. Yeah. I think they have leverage now. You know, you have Danzel with his production company, Taraja with her production company, uh, uh, the, uh, Jeffrey Wright uh, from D.C. He's just hey, isn't that nominated wonderful? for yes. the award for, for the new movie that he's in. So it's it's just exploding, and I think we're just going to continue to be optimistic, and we understand that we have to continue to tell our story. And when our stories get on that screen, and you know they start being blockbusters, that that makes the people look up and say, "Oh, we got to get more of those." I think uh, I think the whole uh, Black Panther thing just bust everything open. You know, so I think it's getting better. Even though you have your in-house drama that's going on, yes, that, that will always go on. right. You know. Well, you know, it's funny because I don't know if you've seen American fiction, but it did, really it, it really talks about, you know, this whole issue of just black <laughs> images and black stories. It and it's a it, it's was, an, it was pitiful and funny at the same time. Exactly. Know? Exactly. And I went to see Origin. Yes. Did you see yes. that? I have seen it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, now I want to see an amazing uh, film. The 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 the, the, the I don't, what's the name of it? They're all sitting at the table like the the black Jesus and the and the Last Supper. Oh, the the uh, the book according to Clarence. Yes, yes. I haven't seen <laughs> yeah. that yet. Oh, you got to see that. You <laughs> have got to see that. It's uh, there's some good films out right now. Right. I'm really impressed with what we what we're seeing. And the reason this is happening because people see the you know the box office. People are yes. going to see this stuff. Yeah. So, so on that side of it, we're optimistic. We continue to do that. We're going to continue to create our own channels. And I think as we begin to leverage our income on the financial side, we're going to create the networks. You know, Oprah created the network. You know, Tyler Perry Tyler created Perry. the network. You know, so it's, it's just going to get better. You always have the in-house stuff going on. Drama creates drama with dramatic people. There's always something going on with us in drama. But the big picture is that once we control our network, control the funding, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better. It's continuously getting better. So the Multimedia Training Institute actually, you know, what is, is what I call the birther, the, 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 the ground, you know, from where, you know, a lot of this talent swells from. You continue to do that. You've got, they're getting ready to open a new theater. I believe uh, yeah. in, in Ward Seven. I can't um, believe I'll be DC. seventy-two this year, years <laughs> old. So I'm opening up new stuff. I mean, what is it with me? I don't know. Well, you know, so we got to do it. Great things just never die. You know, we always the people are always dreaming, and 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 I then know. they make those dreams happen. And so I I'm know. excited for what you're doing. So tell us about it. Well, I'm in Ward Seven. And you all in what age? I got the Anacostia Playhouse. You yes, got we the do. Anacostia Art Center. You got the art. Arc. You got everything in what age? <laughs> what seven ain't got nothing. So we're opening up. We're opening up the first performing arts center in Ward Seven. It's called the, the New Cultural Cafe at Studio W. A little nice. history about that name. The Cultural Cafe I did out of the Potter's House back in the nineties. And then, oh, yeah. and then Studio W was uh, in W Street in, in the two, early 2000s. And so I just combined the two because we're going to have a commercial kitchen in there. 
and we're talking to Central uh, DC Central Kitchen now, working with us. Like you know, the Ark has that little cafe. Right. We'll hook up a cafe in our space, and then we have eighty seats. It's a small place with eighty seats. Okay. We're gonna have cameras all over the place, and you're gonna be able to have your intimate eighty seat audience for whatever you want to do: jazz, comedy, theater, and then we can stream it to the world like you're doing now. We're going to monetize that. You must be getting some good advertisers. You got everything free, free, free. I know. I used to be a subscriber. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. You know, everything. And I'm glad to hear about this win daily. I didn't know about that. But yeah, we're going to stream to the world uh, the Zeta, uh, Zeta Phi Beta, the sorority that Zoe Neil Hurston was a part of. They're coming on the 17th of February. The mayor has declared Zora Neal Hurston Day in Washington, D.C. Wonderful. February the 17th. They're going to have 80 people in the house, but they're going to stream to two, three, four hundred people around the country. Wow. So that Wonderful. possibility is there. So I want, I don't care if you live in one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, come on over to Ward 7 and be a part of it. If you want to do a fundraiser for your organization, you can do it there. If you want to have a forum or whatever subject you want to do, we can do our politics. We can do our, you know, history. We can do whatever. It's like you do there. We we can do it there in live with eighty people. Well, so you I'm see, really excited about that. You stopped at eight, but you could have gone on to nine and any state across the country because your lives or, or around the world actually because yeah, right. everybody will have access right. to what's going to be happening in Ward Seven. So that's right. fantastic, Lynn. Um, I mean, wh why? What need did you think that this? this uh, venue would serve. You you decided to go to Ward 7. Um, I didn't go to, honey. I live down the street. I'm two blocks okay. from my space. I'm a okay. Ward 7 person. <laughs> and, and I was looking for a space because, as you know, multimedia, we're not a theater per se. Uh, we train young people and adults in media arts. We just uh, got a contract with the city to do unemployed, homeless, uh, returning citizens in media arts. We, Wonderful. You know, we just had an unemployed person had been, he did have a 20 year background in IT, but he was unemployed. He mm. came and took our workshops, <laughs> got certifications from Amazon, and now he's making over a hundred thousand a year. That's a great, That's a great story. That's a great story. Unemployed grand. Yeah. You know, he's making more than we are. So I'm just saying that kind of thing is available. So I was looking for a space to do my workshops, but then also because I'm a theater person, we had the space to do it there. So if I'm teaching you in video production, I'm teaching you in digital graphic arts and all that stuff, when the play comes on, you video the play. You do the digital graphics on the play. You do arts administration on the play. You know, uh, So you take the skills that you're learning in the workshops and you apply it to a real kind of thing that's happening. And then the play is, it enables people to come in and use the show to, to raise money. But also the play gives you cultural enrichment. Yeah, I, mean, I had to go to book on Zora Neale Hurston because, you know, as a result, she would die in obscurity and poor and all of that. But this woman is is probably one of the most prolific writers in the 20th century. Oh, no question. You know, no she question. took anthropology and she took uh, 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 fictional writing and she tied the two together and really showed you the details of our history as, of a people and told it in beautiful stories. You know. Well, you know, I think I think Lynn, because I know you were working with uh, Odell, um, oh, who we lost, and had that wonderful Shirley Chisholm play. You told me, <laughs> you were the one that told me that Odell had passed. I'm I'm at the Master Nut Resort, kind of chilling out, and you called about eight or nine o'clock. I said, "What is the niece role out calling me at nine o'clock at night for?" <laughs> and then you told me Odell had passed. By you the way, Odell stop taking Robin. my phone calls, Lynn. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Odell Ruffin was the writer for Campaign 72 and Shirley Chisholm. An amazing, and, an amazing production. And I'm committed to taking that play around the country. I'm still Wonderful. committed okay. to doing that. Yeah, I would. I mean, that's one, too, that I could see, you know, in the theater and videotaped and, you know. But anyway, um, what else you got going on for Black History Month? Well, that Anything? opens. I mean, that's enough. Believe me. Okay. We open All right. on, uh, we open on um, uh, the 15th of February. Okay. And uh, we have the George V. Johnson Jr. Jazz Quartet after the play. Okay. We're going to have a catered vegan Southern style food and out of oh. our commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a full evening. And unfortunately, Denise, we are sold out for opening night. Oh, hey, that's yeah. unfortunately that but is. The next that. night, <laughs> it's still open. Is I hope I can say this is WPFW night. 
Okay. On the next night. So I, I think some tickets are available there. So check the WPFW on that. And then we yes, have, yes. you know, other groups and organizations coming in. But we still have room. For, we run uh, for Black History Month and National Women's Month. Wonderful. So if you want to have an organization, you have an organization, want to raise money, want to have cultural enrichment, you know, please come out and, and, and do that. With and us. how do we, uh, let's put up on the screen how folks can reach out to you. Well, I can give you a phone number, uh, mm -hmm. 202 Four six four five zero two zero. Okay. Of course, you can always go to our website. Let's do that number again one more time, Lynn. Two zero two four six four five zero two zero. Okay. Okay. All and right. then our website is very easy. M M T I D C dot org. Wonderful. Okay, well, you've got a lot going on, and it sounds like a great thing coming to Ward 8, great opportunity, great programming. Ward great 7, community. Ward 7. What did I just say? You said 8. <laughs> you I wonder eight, why. You know, <laughs> Ward 7 needs some love, I'm trying to get it. <laughs> I got you. See, I did that on purpose so that we could continue to say Ward 7. That, that was intentional. Ward 7, but we're inviting all the wards, Ward 9, all of them to come to Ward 7 and see this. Right. Show. All right. Thank you so much, Lynn, for Thank being you, with Denise. us. Yep. And uh, best of luck. I know it's going to be a great success. I expect, I'm, I left two tickets for you for opening night, though. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, thank we'll you. Talk. Thank you. Okay, though. Okay. Take care. Thank you. So uh, if I don't see you on opening night, um, hopefully I will see you there at the venue one day soon because it sounds like it's a great place for people. Like Lynn keeps saying, you want to go there and raise money, use it as a fundraiser. You've got that opportunity. So it's my pleasure now to bring uh, on to the show Gil and Pamela Nelson, local fun filmmakers here in the DMV. Uh, are you all there? Yep. I'm here. Hey, Gil. Hi, Pamela. How are you? Hey. hey. Hello, hello. How are you? I am great. I am doing really great. Excited. It's Black History Month. Happy Black History Month. Oh, thank you. I see you're representing there, Pam, that wonderful uh, shirt with all those uh, black, black women yes. history makers. All my people. <laughs> we, we, we recognize you too, Gil. I don't, don't want to leave you out, but you know. <laughs> So you all are filmmakers. Um, this is exciting because, you know, as Lynn and I were just talking about, you know, uh, some great films out right now. We are really stepping up and really telling some fantastic stories. Uh, some not all, some funny, some romantic, some, I mean, we're all across some, uh, what's your Afrofuturism, you name it, we're telling them. So right. tell us, tell us, tell us what you all are doing. Well, uh, is 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 uh the same way you guys were talking about the gentleman that just passed from cancer and um um and you you spoke on you both said it get checked about getting checked yeah right that was crazy and when i was like wow uh it's 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 not funny but it's uh, uh not a coincidence that we just did a breast cancer film uh about men having cancer title get check where we wow. were makers of the month for in dc for uh 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 was the month january of december was it december december, yeah, december. The month of december. Uh -huh. yeah. okay the month of december yeah that's uh you know you we can't it's funny no matter how many times or how many ways we try to tell this story you know we still are at the top of the charts when it comes to these unnecessary deaths due to certain kinds of diseases that are preventable and mm -hmm. treatable. So, I mean, praise praises to both of you all for, for getting that story out uh, and for picking, I mean, how, when you do your filmmaking, what, what, how do you come up with story ideas? So I think what we try to do is just come together and try to bring awareness on things that are current um, or things that people can relate to. So, um, I kind of dedicated that film to my mom who passed away from breast cancer. Mm, mm -hmm. The twist. You said with a twist? With a twist. Okay. All right. Short film. But um, you, when we start the, the film, you know, we talk about women having breast cancer, but then in the end, 
um, her husband actually passes away from cancer. Wow. And that's not an uncommon story. Yeah. I've heard yeah. that before. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. Gil. We try to go, you know, when we, when we, whatever we decide, whatever story we decide to tell, we try to definitely have some type of messaging in it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we kind of teaching people some or making somebody or bringing something uh, um, uh, to the forefront or making somebody aware of something through uh, entertainment. Yeah, because storytelling. It's easier to slip this information in. Mm -hmm. that. And uh, and that's been, been the tool we've been using. Yep. So the one thing that I think that's great, um, and, and that is that there, the whole idea of filmmaking is is become like uh, Lynn said, more accessible. More people yeah. can can actually create films. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just like some of our local musicians, I mean, they can create. They no longer have to. They can. They their studios are in their houses, so they can do that. Right. But how do you how do you get that product off the shelf and into the you know the hands of, of viewers? Where do you all where do you all show your films and how do you get them distributed? Well, it's so many different platforms. Oh, different. So many different platforms that's that has easy access. Sometimes mm -hmm. the, um, a lot of the platforms that's easy access, you're really not gonna make any money from it, but it's good for marketing, you mm -hmm. know, um, because now a lot of these companies, um, like like Tubi, for instance, um, it's almost like the the new YouTube in a sense, uh, but it's is is reaching. I wouldn't say more people because it it is and it isn't because YouTube is huge, but Tubi is right in everybody's television. So mm -hmm. when you know you got to go and get on your computer or your TV to go to YouTube they are already sitting in front of the TV and, and, and clicking on Tubi. So um, that's why you see a lot of content. It, it's a, a little tough sometimes, but um, it's still an opportunity for somebody to get their product out there and get better at it. So yeah, it's I, so any platform stuff. I've watched a long, long program with uh, Roland Martin, who mm -hmm. uh, has no love for Tubi <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> and and talked about you know the owner of two V is also the owner of Fox News cool. and went on and on and on so you know it's it's um, but I mean people do what they have to do right to get the word out and then to move on and do something else. But so, also, also what people don't realize too is that's the same exact way Netflix started. When you go back to the beginning of Netflix, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. You couldn't mm -hmm. believe some of this stuff was on here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know. So what are you, what are your aspirations? I mean, what do you all plan to do with your films? What what's what's down the road? Well, well, we want to try to reach as many people as we can, uh, trying to find um um, you know, our niche in the uh in the business to uh keep creating the films that we want to make. So independently you could kind of do that because when you're going through studios, that ain't gonna be the case because they can't tell you what you can and cannot do. And when you're doing them independently, you kind of have that freedom. You just still have to stay within a certain uh, uh, structure to make sure they're right. Uh, and um, if you're trying to make some money from them or you know, for them to reach uh, as many people as possible. But we also do stage. So, um, and we're never gonna stop doing that. So what are what are the themes? What are the I mean we talked about breast cancer, but what kinds of when when we see for first of all, let me ask you cuz I know uh, we we talked about, you know, you know, Pam and Gill, but is the is there a company behind what you all do? Is there let's talk about what the name of the company is. So our company's name is Timeless Entertainment. Okay. And um like you said, we do all three. We do stage, theater and film. So it's a it's a company we started in 2014 and we've had about um so all of our stage plays have sold out each play we've ever done has always sold out um and we try to do them every year if not twice a year um and during COVID, that was like the only time we wasn't like putting up shows because right. the world shut down then but 
before then, every year, and after that, it may have been once or twice a year. And the themes, what kinds of uh, themes do you all focus on in, in, we, your, in your theater? We or, talk on family matters, love, marriages, um, kids and family. Um, we touch on um, yeah, illnesses. It, 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 <laughs> It varies. We don't really. Yeah, know. it's not one avenue that yeah. we go down. We yeah. it's like a whole plethora of things we talk about. And so, where do you get your talent? I don't know, God. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we, God. Uh, actually, all all the people that we've hired this far in our productions have been local. Okay. Um, so we we take pride in that because we're both from DC, and and sometimes it's tough to break into this business from stage uh, or a uh, 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 film on TV. So we try to bridge that gap and give people opportunities to uh, be a part of something that uh, they'll be proud of. Yeah. And th w what's your background? Do you all have like background in theater? Did you act? Did you, I, you I, know? He has a background. He studied uh, yeah. theater and film. And, college, but for uh, me, no, yeah. I got thrown into the fire. <laughs> But uh, yes, but she's an excellent actress. Uh, so we both, uh, um, my background is acting before I started directing and producing. Okay. And, uh, started acting first uh, in our productions and then uh, now she's producing. And I'm pretty sure how she tried to boss me around the house, she'll be directing soon. <laughs> Don't take long, I'll tell you. He directs everybody, but I direct him. You give a woman an inch, they're gonna take 35 miles. I mean, I can see so it, I can hear it, Pam. Uh, two cent, now he cost me 50 cent. So, <laughs> so uh, do you have a production that's, uh, or a film that, that's out right now? Uh, no, we actually get ready, uh, going to production for a new film. Uh, okay. a movie that uh, we wrote. Um, okay. we just completed, uh, the script. So now we're going to go into production this year. Okay. So, that, so you all write as well. Oh yeah. yeah. We write a lot of our content. Mo majority of our content, we write on, on our own. Okay. Yep. And is it, um, I mean, what kind of, is it, is it, um, what I'm trying to say? I mean, is it, I, it sounds like it's a combination of like there's drama, there's a little comedy, there's romance is all that wrapped into maybe one production yeah well, you, we're gonna touch every bone we're gonna yeah, touch funny bone you're gonna cry you know you're gonna when, do a little bit of everything you know when it's stage you can go on that roller coaster yeah but with film we kind of try to stick to whatever that that genre is i got you, know? you. Uh, but, but so now we can do whatever so for the films for those who you know will go to tubi is that where your films are right now no, nah, no. Nah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Is there I, anything, anything out there that folks can kind of take a look at? No, not right now. Um, okay, all right. Not, um, because we wanted to make sure all our T's were are uh, uh, crossing uh, out, dotted. Yes. Uh, a film, you know, uh, is not like stage where once a film is made, you got to really know what you're doing to be able to get the money back. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. But we want to make sure that we uh was real versed in how all that process is before we start jumping out there making a million films that's just sitting on a tube. Exactly. It makes sense. It makes sense. So, um, you know, for folks that are watching and they may want to, um, you know, sort of be, be one of the, one of the participants in one of your films or your stage plays, or they've got some technical training or something they'd like to offer. How do they reach out to you? Well, they can reach out through, uh, timelessentertainment.net. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, shoot us the information that way, or they can follow us on any of the social media platforms. But when we do castings, uh, we put it out there. Um, like, um, it's a new TV show that, um, I'm working on and Pam is going to be working on. Um, we, we aren't the producers of that show, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm be directing on it and Pam be, um, helping produce, uh, but um, we just had a cast and it probably was like 500 people showed up. Oh, amazing, amazing. And, and that uh, uh, show is gonna be filmed here mm -hmm. in DC. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Yeah, okay. we, we posted that casting call as well. So. Okay, and when you say posted, it's posted where? Social media. Social media? Yeah. Okay. All right. right. Um, producers did a live where, you know, they were, um, 
telling people, you know, how to come out and audition and when the audition was. So that was like about two Saturdays ago. So they're okay. done. And then they also accepted online auditions as well. Okay. So we're always looking for new people. And there's um, people who are in this area. I mean, you don't have to go to California. There's a lot of companies in this area that, that are doing great work. And they're always looking for you know, um, talent. So, well, one thing, you know, we do a lot of, um, sort of uh, help and, and, uh, have great connections over the office of cable television, film, music, and entertainment, <laughs> or, uh, you know, which promotes a lot of local artists. And, mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully you reached out to them. I know Angie, Angie, Oh, you, who the, you all are filmmakers of the month. Did I miss that? Oh yeah. We oh. December for December. Oh, for, for, for get checked. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and who named you? I'm sorry. Latoya and her staff. Latoya. Oh, at the office. Okay. No. Okay. That's, yeah. that's why Sherry was like, <laughs> 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 yeah, so that's great. I mean, you know, I, hope, I don't, I, it, it's good. I mean, I think you've got folks over there, Angie Gates that used to be there and Latoya that's there, Latoya Foster now, you know, really trying to do a lot to promote uh, uh, local theater, uh, local film, right? Local music, all of that. So, congratulations! Thank you. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> now, how can we see that film? So uh, we had um, we had um, did a screening. We only showed it what once, babe. We did a screening, and we did about four shows that one day. Okay. But, um, because it's a film, you can always show. We plan on we plan on having another public screening. I can't hear my phone. Wow. Okay. So um, we had, I was just telling her that we had one public screening already and we did about four shows that one day. Hello. Um, so right. we plan on having another um, screening soon. And when we do, we will definitely um, post it and let every, you know, body know on our social media platforms um, when they can check us out. Okay. Well, Pam, we, we lost, um, uh, yeah. we lost Gil, yeah. uh, and uh, we don't want that to happen to you. So we want to <laughs> thank you all for being with us. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you so you much. Know, thank um, you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Keep working. We know, you know, this, this business is tough, but you know, it when it's, when it gets hey. tough, the tough get going. And yeah, uh, thank you I, all. I would be remiss to not mention uh, the TV show that's on now, Double Cross. Double uh, Cross. That I direct on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And where can folks see that? It comes on. Um, they they release a new episode every Thursday night. Um, so they're about the third. This third episode just released yesterday for the fifth season. But if you want to catch up. And um, on the show, you can go to um, All Black or you can go to Prime and you can see season one through and catch up all the way to now, which is season five. Great. OK. All right. Thank you. Tell Gil we can't hear him. But, you know, thanks a lot for being with us. He's saying a lot over there. but We, yeah. we will talk to him soon. But thank you all for joining us. OK. Thank all right. You. Good luck. OK. Bye bye. Bye bye. I tell you, if you have a dream, you have to pursue it. So that's what I like. And that's how, you know, when we talk about Black History Month, these, we are talking about people who from the beginning had an idea, a dream, a thought, and they pursued it. And they may have been the first. There was no roadmap for them to follow. They just jumped out there and did it. So we hope that some of the conversations that we have are having today uh, inspire you as well. We're going to change uh, uh, sort of the subject a little bit now and talk about uh, black women in business. And it's my pleasure to bring on Ogo. And I'm going to have to ask her to give me the correct pronunciation, but it's Equimeme? Equimeme. Equimeme. I'm yes. putting too many syllables in it. Equimeme. Mm. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for being with us. Um, so you are with uh, Health Lead Her. So yes. tell us what that organization is all about. Sure. Um, Health Lead Her in a quick elevator pitch is a health equity innovation accelerator. That's a mouthful, but what it simply means is we are in the business of empowering multicultural and diverse business owners in the health space so that they can be more impactful in their communities while building wealth and economic prosperity. How do you help? What, what do you do? 
So one of the biggest ways is through strategic education and technology. So we teach our business owners and our clients how to access government health funding Ooh. and the government health contracting to fund programs on the community level where they're helping to improve health outcomes for communities that look like ours. And but they're accessing government money in, in order to do that. And now it creates this channel where not only is our community benefiting, they are able to build wealth, especially for Black women who over-index in the healthcare system. So Olga, one of the challenges uh, that a lot of particularly smaller businesses, Black-owned businesses, women-owned businesses face is that, you know, we, we have to go through these like certifications and all these other things before we can even get into that government pipeline government funding pipeline. Do you assist with that as well? Yeah, so we we have a number of resources. And just to take it a step back, I, I teach a very fundamental principle around government health contracting. There, there are two sides to this coin. There's traditional government health contracting. And if anyone ever presents to you and says that they're having trouble, they're having difficulty just getting into the marketplace, they've tried, they haven't won anything, Nine times out of 10, they are tackling it from that traditional contracting lens. Mm. We teach community impact-based contracting, where you are specifically targeting the opportunities where you are most equipped to be successful. The government has um, guidelines and parameters that fit and are very appropriate for us as women-owned and Black-owned businesses. They are easier to win. And because you are able to speak to the needs of your community more readily and more easily, you qualify and able to showcase value um, more than you would on the traditional side of government contracting. We start our education on the community impact side because we so want you me, to be more successful faster. Give us an example. When you say community, I mean, I think we understand community Im impact, but from mm -hmm. your perspective or, or a business that you've worked with, uh, what do you mean by community impact? Sure. So a hallmark example is, you know, like, let's say there's a woman that has a, a staffing agency or she wants to do recruiting and staffing. That's her business model. She's probably going to look at staffing based contracts. And those usually fall in the traditional realm where you are helping the government beef up their operations. They need physical people. You supply physical people. But when you bid on those types of contracts, because it's more commoditized and they know there's a lot of companies that can offer them the same services, you're now competing on price. And small businesses get beat out so frequently because they just can't come down on the numbers in order to be profitable and win the contract. Versus that same woman, I would say, okay, let's pivot. You're still supplying nurses and resources, but now you're doing on the community end where the community is benefiting from all the um, staff members that you're providing. And you may do a outreach program where you're reaching out to the community to educate on diabetes. So you're still staffing because you're gonna need nurses, but now you're going to the community and not just internal operations for the government. And because that is such a high priority for the government, you don't have to compete on price. They're very clear about their budget. They want to know how much value are you going to give them for the amount of money they want to spend. And because you're women-owned, you're uh, a woman of color, you're closer to the community, what you're able to speak to highlights that you're the more appropriate choice for that type of contract. So, you know, um, because there's, as you said, there was a standard way of, of uh, competing for these contracts and now impact, um, you know, is, is has a heavier weight and, and means maybe more significant. But when when did you see this transition? Is it because, you, and I know there's a lot of money that goes out, government spend a whole bunch of money on issues and problems. And in the end, they let another contract and send a whole bunch of money to do the same thing, but there has been no the impact. Thing, yeah. So is there, um, is there a, uh, yeah, um, when uh, I'm hearing myself, so when the government, um, when did you see that transition in government contracting? It, the funny thing is it's always been there. That infrastructure or this, this duality of the size of contracting, it's always existed. 
The problem is it's no one has really put a name and face and framework to this side of contracting. When I first started, I took all the classes. I, I sat down with as many gurus or strategists that, as I could find. And I realized that what they were teaching me just wasn't working. And I was able to discover this in process as I'm reading and investigating and talking. And I'm realizing, oh, wow, if we can just align ourselves with this community impact lens and focus strategically on that pot of money, then our small businesses can win at a much higher rate than if they were to just compete with on the traditional side. Then on top of that, because these dollars are set aside or the intent of these dollars is to come to our communities, we're more impactful, we're more effective because we are coming out of the same communities the government is trying to serve. And I fundamentally believe if you're going to change a community, whether it be in health, well-being, prosperity, economic development, it needs to come from those who look like the people you were trying to impact. And that's a fundamental principle for our business. Well, I love, I mean, I love the concept. I know that it also works uh, just in, also in, um, uh, you know, nonprofit funding as well. People really uh, want to see impact. And, you know, we don't do these services just because we've got time, but we do mm -hmm. want to make a difference. And so it's good that you uh, have found that niche and that you're sharing this with women um, in the in the healthcare field. Um, you have a conference that's coming up. Yes. Tell we us do. about it. Oh, this this is the highlight conference of the year for anyone that is in the health, wellness, community impact space. Our conference this year will take place on February 22nd to 24th at the Gaylord at National Harbor. Um, the theme is building wealth while in transforming health. And that's like our fundamental principle. And we're doing something that no other conference can even claim. We are going to give out over 10 million in health contracting opportunities to wow. all participants. That Can you conference. say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> we are giving out 10 million in health contracting opportunities to every participant that comes. Wow. Even if you are brand new to the government health contracting space, you will have an opportunity. Our team is going out, sourcing these opportunities, pre-qualifying them, making sure that they match what our business owners can do. And when you come into this conference, not only will you know what's available, ready for you to sign or submit your name to, you will have the partners that you need in the room. So if you're a team of one and you've been hesitant, you can come and you will have your partners right there in the room. And we literally would be matchmaking and making sure that not only do you know what you qualify for, you've got the people to team up with so that 2024, we can level up our businesses. And that's our core goal. You know, I, I wish, Olga, we had, I went over on a couple of interviews, but I really wish we had more time to talk. But I think that that is really key and crucial uh, of all the things we've talked about is that there's a place and time now where people can go and learn more um, about um, the program, uh, the opportunities, uh, and how to prepare themselves for um, more government contracting, uh, women entrepreneurs, particularly in the healthcare field. So yes. I want to thank you so very much for being with us. I hope that uh, folks are, let, let's show that one more time, Sherry, the, the flyer, yes. so that we can let folks see. And any, la any parting thoughts, um, Ogle, before we go? I would, I would just emphasize you want to be in this room. We have political stakeholders, government officials, business owners who have made millions and billions in government health contracting, really bridging the knowledge for small businesses and women-owned businesses, and especially for women of color. You can find out more about our conference at mwih.com. Again, that is mwih.com. And you can, of course, follow me at Health Lead Her. Wonderful. Ogo, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, hope to hear about some of those successful businesses that got those contracts. We'd love to have one or two of them back with you uh, in the coming coming weeks or months. So let us know if uh, who the successful ones are. Oh, of course. Thank okay. you. Thank you All so right. much. All right. My pleasure. Thank you. So finally, because we are running out of time and I want to make sure that I get Lauren Vaughn at the table or into the room, president and CEO of Samaritan Inns, uh, and talking about a really, so Sherry said, sometimes we might have to come back 
Warren and really talk a little bit more. But we're talking about uh, overcoming addiction. And, you know, I was joking about January being a dry January, but, um, you know, that is significant in the lives of people who um, I believe have addiction problems. So paint the stage for us about what's happening with uh, alcohol abuse in DC. Okay, well, hi, Denise. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sure. having me on today to talk about Dry January and the great work of Samaritan Inns. It's awesome to see you. Um, dry January reflects a positive shift in society's attitudes towards alcohol consumption. So I think Dry January has been a great thing and it helps to raise awareness about the work that we do at Samaritan Inns, uh, providing structured uh, residential addiction treatment and recovery services to homeless and at-risk men, women, and mothers with children. Um, although uh, Dry January ended a few days ago, um, um, and many people, um, you know, will will go back to their their normal routines. Uh, for people who are fighting addiction, um, it's an everyday struggle that goes that's uh, the entire year. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, I know people personally and uh, how they celebrate. You know, they're either Alcoholics Anonymous or or other programs that they've been into, and probably Samaritans as well, where they actually you know check off that year, you know, celebrate that year of sobriety. Um, but what is the road like to get from addiction to sobriety that you know Samaritan may take folks through? Um, well, the the individuals that we serve are the most at risk. About 70% of the people who come to us um, are homeless um, or housing uh, at risk of um, losing their housing. So what we provide in addition to addiction treatment is a safe space um, because it, uh, all our programs are residential addiction treatment and recovery services. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people often come to us right out of detox, um, right off of the street, and we provide a safe space and the tools where they can um, gain the skills that they need for long-term uh, sobriety. Because recovery is, it, it is a lifelong journey and um, it doesn't stop January 31st. It continues year round uh, for people who struggle um, with addiction. Um, and there's also been many uh, criticisms, I guess, and challenges um, on how municipalities, including the District of Columbia, um, you sort of manage um, uh, services um, for, you know, government regulations or whatever, for, you know, for addressing substance abuse disorder. Is there anything that's going on in the district right now that you think is significant uh, as it relates to uh, recovery services? Yes, uh, thanks for asking that question, Denise. Uh, substance use providers, um, especially residential um, substance use providers, are faced with a myriad of challenges um, um, and recent changes that have been implemented by the district government, um, which are uh, impacting the way we are able to provide services for our clients. Um, and uh, specifically, be, um, we are a Medicaid provider and have been um, a Medicaid provider since 2013. We previously received 90 day authorizations to provide structured residential treatment. Um, but the city uh, and DC, uh, DC recently made the decision to outsource the authorization process. And so now instead of getting 90 day authorizations to provide treatment, we get 14 day authorizations to provide treatment. So it has um, drastically increased the amount of paperwork and decreased the amount of time that clinicians are able to spend uh, with clients. And then, you know, most of the people who come to us um, are homeless. And so to have to worry every two weeks, every 14 days about where they're going to lay their head um, two weeks from now uh, prevents them from really being able to focus on their recovery. So um, some of these changes that, that the district has made uh, make it harder for us to provide good services to people most in need.
What what is there any rationale that you can think of? What did the district use to to make this change? And that's such a you know a, a big change. I mean, from four, from ninety to fourteen days. The intent the intent was to make it more person centered, more individual, um, more individually tailored to each person. But it has actually had the complete opposite effect because of all the paperwork and red tape. Um, um, it has, uh, it prevents that smooth transition um, and length of stay mm -hmm. uh, to provide treatment for people most in need. And on average, I mean, if you if you could give a, a length of time, I mean, is 90 days even enough? Well, when we were getting 90 day authorizations, we could almost guarantee six months of structured residential treatment. Okay. So we would have um, a treatment plan and an individual would, would come in and be able to focus on um, each stage of their recovery, knowing that they were going to be here for, for six months. But the two-week authorization process has changed that, and people are more worried about finding a place to stay um, um, and are unable to focus on their recovery in the way that they really need to because they're worried about getting a job and finding a place to live. If you can could paint a picture, Lauren, of, of the severity of the problem of, of uh, substance abuse, uh, particularly alcohol abuse in the District of Columbia, what, what does that look like? What, what are we what are we facing? The, the numbers are the numbers are huge. And just uh, for instance, in the United States, there are almost 29 million adults um, who have issues with alcohol use disorder. And then here in the District of Columbia, one in 10, one in 10 residents uh, suffer from an alcohol use disorder. Uh, and that is twice the regional and national average. And then I also want to add that one in eight DC residents suffer from a substance use disorder, which is also twice the regional and national average. Um, so while we are working to reduce this, the numbers um, seem to be getting uh, seem to be increasing. And, 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 uh, and how how is how is that substance um, use disorder defined? I mean, what, at what point does a a use of a substance become a disorder? <laughs> um, it becomes it becomes a disorder when it um, impact impact uh, how a person is able to um, live and manage their life, their lives um, when mm -hmm. they become uh, so dependent on um, on a substance, whether it's alcohol or drug. Um, it upsets uh, and interrupts um, the productivity in their lives. And did that, do you find that that increased uh, post COVID or have our numbers always been high? Our numbers have always been high, mm -hmm. but the pandemic has only exacerbated the problem. I see, I see. So what's next? What are the next steps? Um, are there, are, I mean, now that you are facing this 14 day, um, um, I guess, limitation or, um, you know, what you just described, it, it, is there an effort to reverse that, to get the council to, I mean, what, what, what's the next step? Yeah, great question. So we are working to, um, we are working to uh, ask the government to make, to, to make changes. Um, but that's not an easy process. We are, I am making the rounds, um, meeting with uh, council members, council member Christina Henderson, um, who oversees uh, the Committee on Health, um, Chairman Mendelson, and, um, and others trying to raise awareness about the issues that SUD providers are facing in the city. So well, we we'll continue to support DC's most vulnerable residents. Wonderful. We're going to keep our eyes uh, open and that I'm sure there will be some council hearings and some other things that may go on as you all push, push, push back on this. Yes, and, I can uh, on Monday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, well, I want to thank you very much for bringing this to our attention and bringing this to our, our viewers. And uh, I mean, always glad to know that Samaritan Inns is there regardless of w what the limitations are um, or what the opportunities are. It's good that uh, Samaritan Inns is there to to uh, address the issues that impact our community. So I wanna thank you so very much as a thank CEO uh, for being with us today.
Thank you very much, Denise. Good to see you and happy Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. So we conclude this week's broadcast and we hope this, the discussions that we've had today shed light on some remarkable contributions by African-Americans in various fields and also some of the issues that impact us as a community and how we can engage in making a difference uh, in our community. We want you to join us throughout the month as we continue to celebrate and honor Black history. I want to thank all of you all for joining us today on this enlightening podcast episode. And uh, as I said, we've covered a lot of topics and we just want to make sure that you share this with your friends, family, colleagues. Join us every Friday from 12 to 1 here uh, as we on Win TV as we have great conversations with our community on Let's Talk. This is Denise Rollard Barnes signing off. Have a great, great weekend. See you next week. <music>